The Gospels are a great place to go to to learn about the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. But if you want to learn more of who Jesus Christ is as the Son of God, as Lord, Savior, what theologians call Christology, then I'd invite you to turn to the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation or to go to the book of Hebrews. Both of them lift up Christ in a manner that exalts him as King of kings and Lord of lords. And there's a passage I'd like to share with you today as we continue in this series. And the passage, it, it has a little hidden secret message as well. You know Paul's message to the Corinthians where he talks about love, faith, hope, and love. See if you hear the faith, hope, and love in this passage in Hebrews. It's about perseverance of faith. It's on the front of your bulletin as well. Listen to God's word to you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we confess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks for the reading hearing of this word, and pray that your spirit would inspire this word in each of our hearts. Give us that nugget of truth which you would have us leave this sanctuary with, to be strong in our faith, bold to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we are studying this book right here, and it's Craig Barnes, familiar face. He was in this pulpit a couple years ago as the Carson Lecturer, uh, president just down the road in New Jersey at Princeton Seminary. And he's written this, written this book to, as Reclaiming the Heidelberg Catechism, and so we're third in a series out of five, trying to understand our faith, what we believe and how this particular catechism might help us in that way. So, Craig Barnes tells a, a very funny story that he's at a party, a gathering, and this man, kind of an acquaintance, doesn't know him well, they're talking a little bit, and he asks Craig, well, so what are you working on? And Craig's all excited about the Heidelberg Catechism at this party. And so he, he tells him about the history of it and how it meant so much in his life and development. And he goes into some neat theological insights. And this guy's eyes are just kind of glazing over. You know, he's just not getting it. And so Craig goes to that most profound of questions, the first one that we studied two weeks ago. And that question, what is your only comfort in life and death? And so he quotes this answer to the man. My only comfort is that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He said this to the man who continued to have this puzzled look on his face. Even, you could say, almost an offended look on his face. Who finally said back to Craig... And this works for you? <laughs> now, the very question, I think, is indicative of the culture in which you and I live. The man didn't ask if what he believed was true. He didn't want proof positive of some mystical experience, some life transformation, or some spiritual explanation. 
He was rigorously pragmatic in his question. Careful not to step over that tolerance boundary that we're so careful about these days. He was just asking if it worked for Dr. Barnes. Now, in thinking more about this question, Craig Barnes believes the assumption beneath the question is really asking you and me this question. Does Christianity work for you? The assumption that this man had at the party is actually, and could be said, that we are all saviors of our own life. If it works for you, good. Go for it. That's your thing. Do it. You see, it's a daunting challenge if that's true, however. All we have to do is to see whatever works for our life in the right place, whether it be exercise or education or making of money or hard work or even a 16th century catechism. Whatever works for you. Good. Go for it. The man at the party was trying to be politically correct, um, religiously tolerant of others. But clearly, this man was shocked that this articulate, educated president of a graduate college, a seminary, believed it a comfort to belong to a savior. The question Craig could see in the man's eyes was, why would anybody give up control of their lives? Well, Christians believe we need a Savior. And we also believe that this Bible is the Word of God, and it gives us the truth of who that Savior is. The Heidelberg Catechism makes that crystal clear in the question and answer number 29 when it says, He saves us from our sins, and salvation should not be sought and cannot be found in anyone else. (coughs) Makes it very black or white. Christian believes this, this statement, Not because it works for us, but because we believe it is true. As we said last week, we talked about sin, which the Heidelberg Catechism uses the term misery. It has separated us from God. Who we are has separated us from God, from that true creation, a creature who we were meant to be, that we talked about Um, we had the high purpose of knowing God intimately, to experience the holiness. That was the purpose for which we were created. But we believe, in, in Paul's words, as we find in Romans, when we fall short of this level, of this glory of God. And despite the claims of um, what you all probably grew up with in vacation Bible school or in Sunday school of Jacob's ladder. If you read in Genesis 28 the whole story of Jacob's divinely inspired dream, Jacob is not climbing up the ladder making salvation work for him. The angels are climbing down the ladder. Not ascending, but descending to us. Our hope, what this shows is one of those um, subtleties that you got to look for from uh, different verses that Christianity throws in time. Our hope does not come from our climb up, whichever works for you. Our hope comes from God's climb down, 
to us in Jesus Christ. The great Philippians 2 passage. And as Craig says, hope descends, and that changes everything. So, what would you say? And this works for you? Or to get specific, if you were asked this by a non-Christian, what would be the main thing that you would want to get across in your response? You don't have a lot of time. You only have an 18-minute sermon. So what are you going to say? If you follow Christian guidance, which then says that there are statements that we can use to help us express what we believe, called statements of faith, which is exactly what we know that the Heidelberg Catechism is, that we will see that the answer to the story of salvation in most of these, if not all, of these statements of faith are really similar to the one which you know best, you and I have memorized, many of us, the Apostles' Creed, which takes on a trinity formula. I believe in God, the Father, and in Jesus Christ, who's only for God's sake, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. It's kind of interesting because you can really use that whole basis to describe what is it that you believe. Does this work for you? You could base your answer on the Apostles' Creed and the Heidelberg Catechism based questions 26 to 52 all on expounding upon the Apostles' Creed. By the way, it's on the website. If you don't have a copy, go to our website. Link right on to the Heidelberg Catechism. And uh, you can read all those. And a good place to start in expressing this answer to what's going to explain your faith to someone, why you would even say that Jesus Christ is your only comfort in life and in death, is in Jesus' baptism. Isn't it interesting that all four Gospels begin Jesus' public ministry with his baptism? This is a wonderful new painting. It's only six years old. It's by Daniel Bonnell. Jesus' baptism tells us at least two very specific things. Jesus' baptism, well, it begins Jesus' public ministry. So before that, we don't know much about him. We assume he's about 30 years old. You know, we know a few things, but not much. So it initiates his public ministry. And Jesus' baptism actually tells us it depicts Jesus' anointing as the Son of God. And it declares Jesus as the agent of God's mission to save the world he loves. Jesus' baptism. And this, this anointing is, is beautifully described in this question number 31, which is in your bulletin, right under the heading of the um, sermon. That's the one question I picked out of all those to give to you. And you'll see scriptural reference underneath that you can look up um, the basis on which they make these statements, all scripturally supported. Why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? Because he has been ordained by, the God, by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who fully reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our deliverance. Our only high priest, as we read in Hebrews, who has delivered us by the one sacrifice of his body, 
and who continually pleads our cause with the Father and our eternal King, who governs us by his word and spirit, and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom that he has won for us. You could spend a long time understanding how powerfully that can affect our lives as Christians, each line in that one answer. You know that Christ means, in Greek, the anointed one. Same word of Messiah in Hebrew, the anointed one. To be anointed means to be set apart, but for a holy mission. Now today you're going to vote on deacons and elders who are set apart to be ordained. That is for specific responsibilities. Similar to the sanctification coming from anointed for holy purpose, but even ordination is set apart for specific responsibilities. Jesus is anointed at his baptism. He's set apart, and for what? For a holy mission. And what's the holy mission? To offer salvation to the entire world. This is confirmed over and over again, all through the New Testament, through the Holy Spirit. It was... At when Jesus was born, caused by the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary. Uh, at his baptism, it is the Holy Spirit, and, and we even saw that in the, in the painting, um, ascending um, as a dove. And words that were spoken, uh, this is my son with whom am I well pleased. Um, the Holy Spirit is the one that drove Jesus uh, into the wilderness and through the temptation story. By Jesus himself, he says, in Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Holy Spirit. Because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. And it continues through a couple of other verses. Our text from Hebrews that we read, it confirms this anointing of Jesus as our perfect high priest. He offers his own blood as, as at the heavenly sanctuary so that in verse 10 it says, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ for all. And since Jesus Christ is now our high priest, we may now come before God in utter confidence with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Those are the words of Scripture of which our baptism assures us that was the whole part of the passage in Hebrews 10 when it sa where it says that our hearts have been sprinkled with water. Our baptism in the faith. You see, baptism is, the critical, is critical for our understanding of Jesus and who we are who are baptized in the faith. And that's why the very next question in the Heidelberg Catechism, question number 32, it talks about how we share in this anointing together. Whenever we share with others why Jesus is our only comfort, whenever we offer ourselves for others as he offered himself to us, whenever we live by the vision that God's kingdom is come on earth as it is in heaven, when we do these things, we are living our anointing as agents of Jesus' holy mission. And this leads to the final question that I want to share. So 31 was one I wanted to highlight. And then this leads, this baptism that we start with on who Jesus is and that anointing and what it means to us, it leads all the way to his resurrection. And we find that right there in question 45. How does Christ's resurrection benefit you? What starts with baptism and this anointing to a holy mission to save the entire world, to offer himself as an atonement and sacrifice is completed in the resurrection from the grave. And so the answer here is three parts. First, by his resurrection he has overcome death so that he might make us share in the righteousness he obtained for us by his death. Second, by his power, we too are already raised, to a new, already raised to a new life. Third, Christ's resurrection is a sure pledge to us of our blessed resurrection. 
After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples and he helped them see that his ministry was so much more than just providing daily comfort and ease for us to get through every day. Though that is a good purpose, but it's so much more. As Barnes says, in rising from the dead, Jesus overcame the finality of death and all death-like experiences we live in life. This Easter resurrection, which we celebrate in just a few months and celebrate every day of our lives to proclaim as resurrection people, this astonished the disciples and changed their lives. And when we grasp what it means, it astonishes us and changes our lives. That's what the Apostles' Creed promises. Through, though our mortal bodies shall die, there shall be a future resurrection of the body. I believe in the resurrection of the body. We say that in the Apostles' Creed. That is what Paul promises in that famous passage of, in chapter 8. There's nothing that will separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. This belief should not only comfort us, but it should make us fearless. We need to hand out all those hats that say no fear, because we should be fearless. What can harm you when you've already won your life in Jesus Christ? Nothing. That's what Caesar never understood. For three centuries, Rome never understood that. So finally, Christianity took over the whole nation, the whole empire. When people join the church, so I want to go back to this picture and, and close with this picture. I want you to look at that picture and to think what it means to you because I'll just finish with just a, a, a wonderful analogy. I, I love how Craig Barnes keeps us in, in this old liturgical understanding of when we just celebrated baptism two weeks ago, we have a certain way of doing this. But for many, many years, it was very different. And in the early church, it was tremendously different. When you were baptized to lay claim to your faith in the third century, you were stamping a, a death certificate on you if you were found out. So what could the early church do to make the liturgy, the, the different actions that we go through, mean that much more for people who wanted to profess Jesus as their only comfort in life and in death, in body and in soul, our thorough salvation? What could they do? The, 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 uh, the guide, the leader, would have the people come into water, and they would talk about how baptism is part of giving up the old habits, giving up the old life. And as the person was saying this, the person would be taken off their clothes. They had some undergarment on, but they'd be taken off their outer shell of clothes in the water. To which the minister would say, as they lowered the person in with, with just the undergarments on, he would say, buried with him in baptism. And then the minister, coming up from the water, the person would, would stand up, and, and as they were beginning to walk out of the water, they would be handed new clothes to put on over these wet undergarments, to which the minister would say, risen to walk with new life in Christ. As the leader declared that, that the Holy Spirit would envelop us and, and clothe us in the virtues of Christ, these people would be putting on these physical new clothes as symbolism of that. Once church members received life that they could never lose, it made them fearless to proclaim the gospel boldly, which is the favorite word in the book of Acts, the early ch church, boldly to go claim their faith. And though our sacrament ceremony is not as dramatic, the meaning of the sacrament hasn't changed. 
As Dr. Barnes says, the fearless power awaits all who claim their baptismal identity of a risen life in Christ. We follow Jesus Christ in new relationships, in adventures in mission, in, in uh, reasons to work for justice for other people, not because we expect to succeed, but because we're not afraid to fail. How bad can the future be? Will we lose something we cherish? Will we even give our own life? We already gave all that up on the day that we were baptized to follow the Anointed One on His holy mission that began when He came up out of the waters of baptism. And in return, you and I have gained a risen life with God. One that we can never lose. That nothing can separate us from. One that provides our only comfort in life and in death. One that is our thorough salvation in body and in soul. And that works for you? Yeah. I can live with that. Let us pray. Lord, make us bold to say that you are our only comfort, our thorough salvation in life and in death, in body and in soul. Amen.